Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Exploring Cardiometabolic Disease Risk in Young Adults with Intellectual Disability webinar. My name is Nicole Radford, and I'm one of the project managers from the SPIDER project, supporting people with an intellectual disability to access health, and I'll be the facilitator for this evening. Alongside me is Kerry Robinson, project manager of the SPIDER project, and Jade Buller, Katrina Pilbeam and Erin Crimmins from the Workforce Development Team at Western Victoria Primary Health Network. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waterways from which we are all zooming in from today. We recognise their diversity, resilience and the ongoing place that First Peoples hold in our communities. We pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, and I wish to extend that respect to any First Nations people connecting in today. We commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding, respect and reconciliation. We support self-determination for First Nations peoples and organisations and will work together on closing the gap. Just a little bit of housekeeping. The majority of our webinar events are recorded and freely available on our Primary Health Network PHN Learn YouTube channel. Jade will pop the links to access our recorded webinar events into the chat. I have our upcoming events on the screen and you can register for our events on our website. The links will be added into the chat for you. I would like to highlight the next webinars organised by the SPIDER project and these are on the 22nd of August. We have a webinar on oral health inclusive practice and the relationship between dentists and pharmacists. And on the 4th of September, we have a webinar on demystifying the NDIS and mental health interface, and we will continue to deliver webinars during school term four. Please make note of the Western Vic PHN Health Pathways relating to intellectual disability that's shown on the screen at the moment. If you've entered this webinar not displaying your accurate first name and last name, could you please type your full name into the chat box? Only admin will be able to see this and this will ensure that we can issue you a certificate of attendance. For this evening's webinar, all participants will remain on mute. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and I will ask them on your behalf to the presenters during the Q&A time. There is a link in the chat box to complete the survey after the webinar and we will show this slide again at the end of the presentation. Our presenters for this evening are Associate Professor Elizabeth Lambert from Inversion Health Innovation Research Institute, School of Health Sciences, Swinburne University, and Clara, Dr. Clara Zwack, Research Fellow from Sydney School of Health Services, Faculty of Medicine and Health, the University of Sydney. I'll now hand over to Elizabeth to start the presentation. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation to present our work on the topic of uh, cardiovascular disease risk and intellectual disability. So the research project that we are going to present uh, was conducted by Clara as part of, the, of her PhD. And I'm going to first introduce the background and the rationale for conducting such a project, and then I will leave Clara present her results. So cardiovascular disease is a collective term for diseases of the heart and the blood vessels. It includes coronary artery disease, arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy, and so on. And importantly, it affects more than 4 million Australians and causes one in four deaths. So thanks to research in the area, better medication and interventions, the deaths have been uh, declining. However, cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of death in Australia and worldwide. But the burden of cardiovascular disease is unfortunately higher for certain groups of individuals. And this is what is happening for those living with an intellectual disability. In Australia, a study published in 2017 compared the mortality rate in four age groups of individuals with and without intellectual disabilities. And the study clearly indicated that individuals with an intellectual disability are much more likely to die from cardiovascular disease. And this was particularly uh, obvious in those who were quite young between 20 and 44, where the mortality rate is four times higher. 
And in, also in Australia, and in 2015, there was a survey uh, investigating uh, the, the, dia the diagnosis of heart disease and comparing people with and without disability. And again, what was found was that in the age group, in the young ones, so those between 18 and 39 years, uh, there was quite a high proportion of people um, reporting uh, being diagnosed with heart disease. And the, the burden uh, of cardiovascular disease has also been documented in other countries, not just in Australia. And this year, a large population stu uh, based study that involved over 2 million individuals living in Denmark revealed that individuals who received um, a diagnosis of intellectual disability had a 24% increased overall risk of early onset cardiovascular disease from childhood to early adulthood. So you can see here on this figure that um, this is the, the cumulative incidence of cardiovascular disease in the two groups of people with, with and without disability. And you can see that from an early age or early uh, adulthood, there is already a difference. And at the age of 40, this difference is even more marked. And what's interesting was that the increase in uh, risk of cardiovascular disease was seen across many different types of disease. And it was also noticed that the um, in the individuals with more moderate or severe and profound disability are the higher risk of overall cardiovascular disease. So basically, the higher the, in, the disability, the higher the risk. So what are the factors that can possibly influence cardiovascular health and why are some groups of individuals at such higher risks? Well, in order to promote cardiovascular disease reduction, the American Heart Association have established what's called the life's essential eight components of optimal cardiovascular health. So this is that circle here. And so those are divided into two major areas, health behaviors and health factors. So the health behaviors include the diet, the physical activity, sleep and uh, nicotine exposures, and health factors include blood pressure, cholesterol, body mass index, and blood glucose. And the American Heart Association importantly notes that uh, pursuing and sustaining a healthy lifestyle from a young age is a successful strategy to maintaining a higher cardiovascular health into middle age. However, one's ability to choose healthy lifestyle across uh, the life course is strongly influenced by psychological health factors and social and structural determinants. So what, uh, what they um, uh, note is that positive uh, psychological health, such as optimism, purpose in life, perceived rewards, and so on, are associated with a more favorable cardiovascular health, and conversely, greater psychological stress and depression are associated with poorer cardiovascular health. They also noticed that a var variety of socioeconomic and st structural determinants of health affect also an individual's ability to optimize the cardiovascular health. And the determinants at, at play are structures and systems. So basically, it means that it's the socioeconomic and the cultural environment, all um, uh, factors. Uh, the community is also important, which uh, includes education, food access, employment, healthcare, housing, and so on. And there are also uh, an, an important um, place of institution and organization, as well as interpersonal and individual factors. Um, so up to now, the studies that have looked at cardiovascular health in individuals with intellectual disability, they have mostly focused on established cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular events. So we know that cardiovascular disease takes decades to develop. 
So for the individuals living with an intellectual disability, it's obvious that this progression occurs at a more rapid rate. Hence, rather than looking at established cardiovascular disease or events, it's actually important to consider early signs of disease, early signs of cardiovascular disease progression. So uh, we know that all of those factors, uh, cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular events are uh, under the influence of many factors that I, would, I described before, but it's actually not known if those early risks are also uh, influenced by those risk factors. The importance of looking at those early signs of cardiovascular disease, it's because it's of course important to better understand what are the mechanisms at play to better prevent and treat uh, cardiovascular disease progression. So what we consider early signs of cardiovascular disease are actually very small changes in the physiology uh, that are generally not investigated in the clinical context, but we could look at that in, uh, from a research perspective. So for our study, we really focused our attention into early signs of cardiovascular disease development. So in the next few slides, I'm going to present the type of data that we concentrated on. So one important aspect of the cardiovascular system is that it's under the control of the autonomic nervous system, in particular sympathetic and, um, and parasympathetic activity. And an, an alteration of autonomic nervous system is usually a hallmark of many cardiovascular conditions, including heart failure, hypertension, and so on. So looking at the autonomic nervous system is actually very important because it's very, it develops, abnormalities develop very early in the, the process of the disease. So we know that high sympathetic activity is associated with elevated blood pressure and, and impacts the heart, the kidneys, and the vessel. We also know that it's um, heart rate variability uh, is a, a poor prognosis of cardiovascular um, uh, disease. And so in the, um, in the re research, uh, we can actually uh, easily look at um, ECGs and blood pressure recordings and extract um, autonomic nervous system markers to, uh, as an indicator of cardiovascular health. Another uh, um, um, marker that we can use is that, well, we know that the sympathetic nerve um, innervates the, the skin, and we can look at what's called the pseudomotor function, so typically in the feet and in the hands. And what we know is that very early in the process of uh, cardiovascular disease and, and also diabetes, those nerves, they tend to uh, decrease. And it's called peripheral neuropathy, and it's an indication of early diabetes. So this is also something that we used in our study. Uh, now, what we, we know is that atherosclerosis, uh, which is characterized by a buildup of plaque in the inner lining of an artery, it usually also develops extremely slowly over decades. And usually in the, in the, in the clinic, uh, it's possible to assess um, the, the, the plaques, so the, using an ultrasound. But uh, with um, some research methodologies, we are able to pick up very early changes of the endothelium, and that we call endothelial function. Or we can look at the endothelial dysfunction in the digits, and we can do that in a non-invasive way. So again, this is going to be extremely uh, useful for looking at populations um, with uh, people with an intellectual disability. To, because it's very easy to, uh, to do. And the, another um, uh, way to measure early signs of cardiovascular disease is also to look at the stiffening of the arteries. So the stiffening of the arteries occurs normally with age, but it's also closely associated to cardiovascular disease. So it compromises the elasticity of the vessels and damages the, blo the blood and it damages um, some organs such as the heart, the kidneys, and the brain. And there are also a number of ways to assess non-invasively the stiffening of the arteries by using at the speed, looking at the speed of the arterial pressure wave traveling along the aorta. So that gives basically an arterial age. So 
with that background, so we know that people living in, uh, with an intellectual disability are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease development. We know that they die earlier, largely from cardiovascular and cardiometabolic disease. But what we really wanted to find out is what are the signs of early cardiovascular risk in these individuals and how does it relate to the risk factors that I um, mentioned before. So this is, is the aim of the study. And so because Clara uh, conducted the study, I'm now going to pass um, it to uh, her and she's going to present her data. Okay, thank you, uh, Elizabeth, for that. Okay, um, so uh, thank you for um, having me here today. I really am excited to share uh, some of the results of uh, my PhD. Um, so I'm going to start, um, before I even go into any of the study details, I wanted to discuss some of the considerations about conducting cardiovascular risk assessments in people with ID. So many obstacles are encountered um, during the collection of health data from adults with uh, intellectual disability. Uh, hence, the majority of published research in this population is um, usually actually based on medical records or death registries uh, or observations from uh, professional caregivers. Um, additionally, obtaining ethics approval can be a really difficult process, especially regarding the consent process. Um, obviously, due to the vulnerability of the population, gaining informed consent uh, for study participation can be very uh, difficult for prospective researchers. So people with an intellectual disability have the legal right to provide or withhold consent to participate in research. And I guess depending on the nature and complexity of the research, um, an individual with intellectual disability might not have the capacity to consent. Um, alternatively, it can be provided by a substitute decision maker. So owing to this grey area, uh, people with intellectual disability are often excluded from um, cohort research studies in Australia and worldwide. Um, the procedure for gaining consent for this study was very strict um, and robust. We developed a checklist to ensure that uh, investigators were able to clearly make a distinction um, between participants who were able to provide their own consent and those where a proxy was required to provide consent on their behalf. So for people uh, with intellectual disability providing their own consent, uh, the form was developed in Easy Read English with accompanying illustrations. Um, and, you know, we wanted to make sure that uh, they could demonstrate their knowledge um, of the undertakings of the project and their willingness to participate. So in our study um, of the, um, of the uh, sample, uh, around 50% were able to provide their own consent. Uh, while the other 50% required a proxy uh, to provide consent on their behalf. Um, and majority of the time it was a family member who provided it, otherwise it was a formal caregiver. So uh, as Elizabeth briefly alluded to, his, um, his overview of the cardiovascular risk factors, including the health factors and health behaviours that contribute to its development. Um, so we really wanted to explore the prevalence of these risk factors in young adults with intellectual disability. As Elizabeth also mentioned earlier, we wanted to um, build a sort of comprehensive profile for this young um, adult population or co comprehensive cardiometabolic profile. Um, so there was e evidence for high risk of early mortality and increased um, incidence of cardiovascular disease, um, as well as previous studies showing um, elevated blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, um, and other lifestyle factors such as reduced physical activity um, in this population already. So even though um, there is a little bit known about uh, the cardiometabolic risk factors uh, that also left quite a few gaps in knowledge um, that need to be filled. Um, hence, we took upon ourselves to, um, you know, uh, undertake this project. So um, the population uh, included, um, sorry, oh dear. Through that too quickly. Uh, so the population included um, young adults aged uh, 18 to 45 years. So there was 39 in the intellectual disability group, and they were compared to age max matched adults without intellectual disability, um, of which we uh, recruited 38. So 39 participants um, with intellectual disability were primarily recruited through uh, Urala, who actually funded my PhD, um, and Goldwyn Options, uh, which was um, both of which are disability service providers located within Victoria. Uh, the majority of the intellectually disabled participants were recruited from regional areas of Victoria, with about 50% uh, of these employed by business enterprises um, that were run by Urala. Uh, 
There was also strong interest from other, many other adults with intellectual disability. However, uh, the age range of 18 to 45 years limited participation. Um, you know, we actually got quite a lot of interest from older adults with intellectual disability, which really demonstrated their keen interest to participate in research projects, which is great to see. Uh, the control group consisted of participants um, who were, um, we tried our best to age match um, and gender match. Um, we also had a very strong response rate from um, our advertisement there as well. So just a quick breakdown though, within the intellectual, um, the uh, group with intellectual disability, there were 17 um, participants who had a mild impairment, 19 participants who had a moderate impairment, uh, one participant who had a severe impairment, and two who had a profound impairment. So um, it was quite a good representation of the population. Um, so our project included um, many, uh, I guess, assessments. So as you can see here is the Iverson Lab, which we set up at um, Swinburne University to conduct the um, experiments. Um, and what we did was we gathered demographic information um, and um, we conducted um, sorry, we gathered so demographic and social information, uh, medical history, uh, medications, family history, physical activity levels, um, and measured subjective stress, uh, socialization, social isolation, diet quality, um, physical activity knowledge, um, and also quality of life through interview and surveys. So that was just the beginning. <laughs> the next part, we completed a physiological assessment to, to investigate the cardiometabolic risk factors and obtained a blood sample for analysis. So as you can sort of um, see, we, our project really involved direct participation um, rather than relying solely on self-reports or care-reported health status. So after, consider, after careful consideration, uh, the lab was also set up with the devices um, to measure beat-to-beat -beat blood pressure, arterial stiffness, as Elizabeth mentioned, endothelial function, and also pseudomotor function. And these uh, devices, like I said, were carefully selected um, because they were non-invasive, uh, easy to use by the investigator, comfortable to wear and use by the participant. They were robust, very fast, um, and most importantly, they were appropriate to use in the um, population of people with intellectual disability. They're also clinically applicable and easily transportable, which came hand in handy later on. So I'll just uh, briefly talk about um, some of the uh, early um, results in terms of the access to health services. So it's interesting to note about the frequency in which participants utilise common health services. So we can see that around two thirds of participants with intellectual disability uh, regularly visit a GP. Um, um, which, and it was even more actually than the um, control group. And um, people with intellectual disability also see a specialist more regularly than the population without intellectual disability. Um, but it's not quite the same story for um, eye checks with almost half the participants with intellectual disability not visiting an optometrist in the last five years. Okay, so moving on to quality of life. So uh, we used the um, EQVAS um, to um, look at self-reported quality of life. So the visual analog scale is from uh, zero, uh, worst imaginable health to 100, best imaginable health. And at the top here, we can see the distribution of self-reported global assessment of health for both the intellectually disabled group and control groups. So the mean EQ VAS score for the intellectual in other uh, ID and control groups was uh, 73.9 for ID group and 76.7 for the control group. So um, it was not significantly different between the two groups. Um, overall, uh, participants with intellectual disability had um, uh, reported more problems with mobility, with personal care um, and usual activities than those without intellectual disability. Um, but they were similar in the pain and discomfort and anxiety and depression domains. Additionally, 30% uh, of participants with intellectual disability reported um, very high health-related quality of life, classified by no problems in any of the domains. 
um, compared to 39% of participants without intellectual disability. So it was about 30 to 39%. Um, so here's just a brief overview of some of the key results uh, in the cardiovascular risk factors that we um, uh, were able to demonstrate. So uh, we had, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, um, impaired autonomic nervous system function, which is obviously very important for regulating uh, bodily um, involuntary body functions. Uh, we also saw um, increased uh, blood pressure, frequency of blood pressure, um, increased blood frequency of hypertension, sorry, um, increased resting heart rate, high prevalence of overweight and obesity. Um, increased blood sugar levels uh, and evidence for prediabetes, as well as increased uh, systemic inflammation. And I'll go into a few of these in a little bit more detail now. So, okay. So as you can see um, over here, uh, we can see the higher BM, um, high BMI and the higher waist to hip circumference ratio, which indicates um, abdominal obesity. And that was both um, significantly higher in the, inter the group with intellectual disability. Um, and over here on the um, right, we can see that the group uh, with intellectual disability also had high, higher systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure, as well as um, uh, increased HbA1c levels in the intellectual, intellectually disabled group. So, and we know that um, HbA1c is considered, well, some of the research is now showing that it's a more sensitive test to use to detect at-risk individuals, um, independent of plasma glucose concentration. So we did see this in our group. Um, so they didn't have high blood glucose, but they did have elevated HbA1c. Uh, so in terms of autonomic function, uh, the, I, the intellectually disabled group um, had impaired systolic blood pressure variability as shown here by the increased uh, low frequency power, you know, indicating increased sympathetic nervous activity. So as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, abnormal autonomic function is associated with signs of metabolic and cardiovascular impairment. So there were no uh, differences seen in the measures uh, of arterial stiffness between the two groups. Um, but the reactive hyperemia index, or RHI, as a measure of endothelial function, uh, whilst it was within the normal uh, limits for the group with intellectual disability, it was uh, trending lower than the control group. So uh, perhaps in a, a larger sample, this difference might become um, more significant. So this, hence, I guess this risk factor really still warrants attention and um, larger cohort studies. So one of the devices we used was this pseudo scan, which measures the ability of sweat glands to uh, release chloride ions in response to electrical stimulus on both the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, uh, which is where the highest sweat gland density is. Uh, the pseudo scan test uh, results can be used as indicators for patients at risk of autonomic dysfunction, and that's through the measurement of electrochemical skin conductance. So. There was strong evidence for pseudomotor dysfunction in the ID group. So limb, mean, um, ESC or electrochemical skin conductance and asymmetry were significantly different between the two groups. So feet and hand electrochemical skin conductance were both reduced in the group with intellectual disability, uh, indicating a decrease in innovation of the sweat glands. Uh, additionally, those with a more severe disability had more uh, reduced limb mean electrochemical skin conductance. Uh, we also found that health-related behaviours and social factors were impacting significantly on cardiovascular health. For example, uh, those who reported more stress, social isolation, and lower levels of phys physical activity were more likely to have poorer cardiovascular health. Looking at stress was a really interesting aspect. So we used the subjective stress survey to evaluate perceived stress. We found that participants in the intellectually disabled group experienced unique stresses compared to the general population. So they experienced more stress associated with uh, perceived self-efficacy, uh, personal vulnerability and decision-making. Um, however, interestingly, interpersonal, interpersonal relationships were not a great source of stress. Uh, for people with intellectual disability. Uh, 
We also found that increased perceived stress was associated with increased arterial stiffness, which was a very interesting result. So uh, stress that was associated with rights and decision making um, and personal vulnerability uh, was related to reduced carotid femoral pulse wave velocity, which is the measure of arterial stiffness. Increased stress was also negatively associated with community integration, uh, indicating that those who were more socially isolated reported greater perceived stress. Uh, social isolation was also associated with obesity um, and abdominal obesity. Uh, in terms of uh, physical activity levels, so total um, activity levels were significantly lower in the group with uh, intellectual disability who reported an average of 172 active minutes per week compared to the control group who reported about 416 active minutes per week. Also, less than one third of the participants with intellectual disability were meeting the minimum recommended physical activity levels compared to over two thirds in the control group. And when we break this down by intensity levels, the biggest differences between the two groups were in moderate and high intensity levels of exercise. So in terms of, um, uh, we conducted two other surveys in the nutrition and diet domain, which were the food uh, choice questionnaire and the nutrition and activity, activity knowledge scale. So, the, in, the group with intellectual disability demonstrated significantly reduced knowledge regarding nutrition and physical activity and overall had poorer diets than the control group. Participants with uh, intellectual disability were lacking knowledge around the nutritional components of food, uh, energy requirements and, and weight loss. However, overall, uh, they indicated a similar knowledge to the um, control group when selecting the healthiest or the best food for consumption. Further analysis uh, also showed that the total nutrition and activity knowledge score was significantly associated with increased waist circumference um, and increased or raised HbA1c levels. So the main outcome of the project um, was the development of a cardiometabolic profile for young adults with intellectual disability. So we were able to add these newly identified risk factors to um, our initial figure, where previously we had some gaps in the evidence, and this resulted in quite a comprehensive profile from, for this population. So what does this really mean? I guess, well, it's an exploratory study, uh, meaning that we can't make any assumptions or firm assumptions yet, uh, but we get a really good idea of what risk factors require our attention um, in order to improve the cardiovascular health outcomes in this young adult population. So there are both clinical uh, um, implications relevant to health professionals and targets for intervention. So interestingly, measuring their blood pressure, uh, which we saw to be elevated regularly, is a simple but very important way of monitoring for early signs of cardiovascular disease. Additionally, um, testing for HbA1c levels um, can help determine diabetes risk. And there's also the additional, um, I guess, a positive aspect that there's no need to fast pre-blood test for this particular test. And along the same lines, uh, the pseudoscan device is a very quick and non-invasive test for screening for pre-diabetes and for diabetes. Um, in terms of intervention, and in particular for stress management, we need to find ways to support decision-making and improve self-efficacy in people with intellectual disability. So lowering stress may prevent development of progression of arterial stiffness, as we saw that relationship, and ultimately improve their heart health. Improving community integration and reducing social isolation may also de decrease perceived stress. Lastly, uh, developing and implementing a health literacy program specific for young people with intellectual disability is another intervention that's being considered. We also need to uh, find out why this young adult population with intellectual disability is at particular risk of cardiovascular disease and early mortality. 
I guess we can hypothesize a few things. It could be because of an aging cardiovascular system uh, or uptake of poor health-related behaviors, or maybe it's linked to the neurological properties of the, uh, of the disability. Um, but really, we require uh, more time and research in this area. So what's next? Uh, last year, I actually conducted a best worst case survey, and this was to elicit the physical activity and diet preferences from people with intellectual disability. So this has never actually been completed before because it, um, it is quite a complicated task in terms of um, asking for preferences, and it's almost a hypothetical preference. So I asked questions along the lines of, if you had to do more exercise or if you wanted to do more exercise, what would make you do more of it? For example, would it be if you did it with friends or would you prefer to do it at home or would you do it if it didn't cost you anything? So it's a form of hypothetical question. The results of this, um, it's yet to be fully analysed, but it may provide really good rationale for designing very specific intervention studies to increase physical activity um, or other aspects such as um, uh, their food choices in people with intellectual disability. Uh, we've also considered proposals to co-design effective pathways to support people with intellectual disability to undertake lifestyle changes and access optimal care, which we all know is very important. Lastly, we clearly need bigger studies and intervention studies to make a real difference in this area. Um, I'm just going to go back to um, the, I guess, um, the participants again, because I really wanted to finish on this positive note. So as you can see here, I, we actually analysed the assessment compliance um, and it was really, really fantastic to see that, um, you know, we managed to get a blood sample from 72% of the population with intellectual disability, uh, which was absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, a lot of the tests, including the endopat, which uh, was measuring endothelial function, actually took about 17 minutes to complete. And this required the participant to lie completely still um, and have a cuff inflated on the arm, which was also slightly um, uncomfortable. Well, I thought it was anyway. And, um, it, you know, as you can see, they they 95% compliance, which was equivalent to the um, those in the control group, which is fantastic. A reason uh, for the high compliance may be the fact that we conducted the majority of the assessments or physical assessments with participants in their own workplace. So we actually travelled out to the business um, business enterprises and the disability organisations within uh, throughout Victoria, um, and this really um, made the participants feel at ease. So they were comfortable and familiar in their environment. Um, I also ensured I visited the disability service organisations several times prior to even starting recruitment, um, so they would become familiar with me have, being around um, their workplace or uh, I guess their, where they had their usual day program. So I just really wanted to make people feel as comfortable as possible. So I wanted to finish on this, that it was an incredibly successful study and we now have one of the largest databases of information about cardiovascular health for this young adult population with intellectual disability. And it's really great to um, see that participants were really, really interested in their health. Um, they reported, or participants and their families both reported that no one has ever paid so much attention to their health. So it really shows the importance of doing this, um, this in-person um, data collection. Um, we also provided them with a health report at the end. Um, obviously, it was in easy read English, um, and we uh, went through it and explained it to them. And if they had any uh, parameters that were outside um, of the norm, um, we would be, um, obviously, we informed that they would take this health report to their local um, general practitioner um, to discuss further. So it was a really uh, unique experience for the um, communities, the intellectually, um, communities with intellectual disability. And it had direct and indirect research benefit. So I'm really looking forward to uh, looking um, or researching in this area further. And I really appreciate the chance to share the outcomes of this project with you today. So thank you. I'm looking forward to um, hearing any questions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Clara. You've shared some really wonderful information with us today of the research that you've conducted. And there's certainly a huge amount of work um, that goes into setting up pieces of research and your PhD that you delivered. So 
um, really wonderful work and really great to hear from you today as well about some of the details that the research has provided but also the real practical strategies that can be um, implemented following on from completing the research. So I'll invite if anyone has any questions to pop them in the Q&A box, um, but we did receive a couple of pre-submitted questions. So I'll start with those in the meantime, um, but we do welcome anyone else to add some additional questions as well. So someone has asked, how can we assess symptoms and client experience if a person is non-verbal and do not use AAC, so they don't use augmentative and alternative communication methods. So I'm happy just to open it up and for either of yeah. you to respond to any of the questions. That's a, it's a really great question. And as I, um, as I guess I, I alluded to, you know, we did have um, some participants who were more on the severe um, to profound um, end of severity of their disability, and it did pose some additional challenges. However, the um, devices that we selected, like I mentioned, were um, selected because they were non-invasive and appropriate for use in people with intellectual disability. Um, uh, in particular, I can just, I guess, go back to the pseudo scan in terms of um, all you needed to do was place your hands and feet on a plate. I think it was not even 20 seconds, um, and that would give an indication of, you know, whether um, they had evidence of impaired autonomic function. So I'm not sure if Elizabeth wants to add any more to that. What I can say is that um, if the person has got a profound disability, it's actually it was actually quite difficult to uh, to measure. I mean, the the more uh, profound the disability, the harder it was, of course, to get the data. But something important to to note is that all of those tools that we used, so endothelial function, arterial stiffness, and so on. They are not tools that are used in the general practice. You know, that's not, they are not used uh, by clinicians to assess um, early signs of cardiovascular disease. So it's very much uh, something that we can do in, in, in a research environment. So, um, but uh, I guess in uh, someone who is nonverbal or profoundly disabled, I guess blood pressure, and is, there are still some, some uh, measurements that can still be done, such as blood pressure, which Clara showed that was extremely important. Excellent, thank you. And I think the examples of those really practical strategies of what general practice and practice nurses and clinicians can do in the clinic is really helpful. But I think having all of those extra tools and strategies that you used in your research was really valuable to gain that extra information. Um, another question that we have been asked is, um, a, provides a bit of a background for the person. So I'll just read this out so I'm not going to miss anything. So a person was born with a hole in their heart, which didn't require an operation, but it's still there and it has grown with them, allowing mixing oxygenated and non-oxygenated blood. They're 13 years old now. And a cardiologist has said a few years ago that they used to operate on the heart but the process has now changed. So there's a communication barrier with um, the teen and they're not physically active at the moment and extremely defiant. So I'm just wondering if there's any recommendations that you might be able to share in terms of those risk factors and maybe what, what maybe could be addressed um, in the first instance. Well, it's a little bit difficult for us to answer because we are not clinicians. And so we are researchers, so I will not be able to comment. I, I'm not in, we are not in a position to comment at that level. I think only a clinician, mostly surgeons, will be able to comment. So, sorry. No, that's okay. No problem at all. I think that, I think that it was a really, a really great question to put forward, though. Um, one of the other questions I have as well is in the research, um, did you also look at um, the medications that people were taking or if they were taking medications and if that also was potentially a contributing factor to cardiometabolic risk? Uh, that's a great question. And yes, uh, we did take um, a medication history and we did uh, look at the relationship as well as whether 
people who were taking the, um, in particular, um, the psychotropic medications and whether there was an association with their cardiovascular risk. And we did find that um, in our specific population, in this young adult population, uh, there was no um, increased cardiometabolic risk factors in people who were taking those medications. So yeah, we did look at that. Um, um, I'm not sure if it's different in the older population. Um, however, yeah, in our population, there was no association. Sure, thank you. And I think that the, the medication topic is a really key area of interest at the moment as well. And one of our most recent webinars was also looking at the responsibility of prescribing and the use of psychotropic medications for people with intellectual disability. So it's a really important consideration. Yeah, I mean, there are obviously a lot of people with intellectual disability. Um, it, there's probably a bit of an over-prescription as well. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting aspect, I agree. Another question that has been asked is, were there any considerations surrounding complex disability profiles or comorbidities that you could advise of? So in the research, if it was, because you talked about the intellectual disability, um, was there any sort of particular considerations around the complexity of the intellectual disability in terms of those aspects? Um, or if there was also any other comorbidities that were um, influencing the results? That's a, another really, really good question. Um, in general, um, the complexity of the intellectual disability didn't really have, um, didn't really change how we performed or um, undertook the, the project. Um, but in terms of the um, second part of the question, so um, whether they had comorbidities, we definitely had a look at that as well. And some of them actually did already have a cardiovascular, a, a cardiovascular disease diagnosis, um, which we took into consideration. So yeah, definitely um, we looked at all those aspects um, throughout the, the, I guess, the analysis. Uh, Elizabeth, just, do you want to? Yeah, I was, just, I was just going to add that um, basically all of our participants, it was a very heterogeneous group of participants. Uh, so the, what we really wanted to, to do is to recruit participants of a certain age and uh, uh, ideally before any development of cardiovascular disease. But we, we were just like interested in that age group because of course, as I showed, those people are much more likely to have a cardiovascular disease and die for cardiovascular disease. But we, we, we and even in terms of the, the disability as such, there was got various uh, origins of, via, of uh, disabilities. So it, it was such an heterogeneous group that we had to sort of take all, all of those factors into account when we analyzed the data, so. Perfect, thank you. Um, and one of the areas that I was interested in hearing more about is the indicators of pre-diabetes and if there was a close relationship between the cardiovascular risk as well as the risk with um, considering pre-diabetes and whether people may be, if they're at high risk of having cardiovascular disease, if that's also increasing their risk of pre-diabetes potentially progressing to diabetes. Elizabeth, do you want to answer that one? No? You, you can answer if you want, but uh, well, I can just just say to, to start that we um, um, we did not look at one cardiovascular risk versus the other one. Is that what that's what you mean? We we looked at so um, so uh, aspects of. Um, arterial stiffness and things like that. And then we also looked at early diabetes, but I cannot recall, I, I don't think that there was any relationship, any specific relationship with HbA1c and any other parameters. So basically what we found is that overall as a group or participants with intellectual disability had a higher level of HbA1c, which means, and it was still in the normal range for most of them. So it, it, it did not mean that they had diabetes, but it meant that it was like, you know, like over the normal, slightly over the normal range. So of course, in the pre-diabetic states. Now with relationships, I, I think it's one of those factors that did not come at positive in any of our um, in, uh, investigations with regards to um, 
environment or stress or anything like that. Am I correct, Clara? I don't think there was anything else. Um, yeah, that's correct. So it was just yeah. isolated. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, so I might wrap up with a final question. So you've shared some really wonderful information today and really incredible research that you've undertaken that's going to lead to those practical implications as well. I'm just wondering if you've got any key take home messages that you'd like to share with the audience today. Um, I think one of the things that I've taken away is the things that the primary healthcare professionals can do in their practice, the things that they can consider when people are coming in and they have potential for um, cardiovascular risk and the things that they can consider on that journey. So I'm just wondering if um, both of you could share your final sort of take home message for today's session, please. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll quickly jump in first. I think um, probably one of the key uh, take-home messages for um, healthcare professionals is that um, there are a lot of, you know, just your regular clinical tests, um, clinic, in-clinic tests that can be undertaken, such as your uh, routine blood pressure that perhaps isn't really completed, um, I guess, as frequently in younger adults in general. Um, but in this young um, population with intellectual disability, it's really important that it is regularly checked for instance. Um, again, same thing for um, HbA1c levels. So it doesn't a, a fasting blood glucose test doesn't necessarily have to be done. Um, we can look at HbA1c levels to give a you know a good idea of whether they're at risk of those prediabetes, um, at risk of prediabetes. So um, those are probably a couple of the key ones that I was thinking of um, before yeah I hand over to Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. And also the, the very last thing that we can say is that from a research point of view, uh, as Clara mentioned, I mean, we do have a very nice database that we've been able to build, uh, but ideally we will need to really have a much bigger database to be able to pick up all the nuances of risk factors in cardiovascular disease development in people with disabilities. So it's probably going to be the next step but this type of project, they take uh, a lot of time, a lot of efforts. And um, so we are slightly moving towards, you know, hopefully developing more studies. And the next step is de definitely trying to figure out what type of, how to prevent the cardiovascular disease development in young people. So what is at play? What are the most important factors that we have to address? Is that lifestyle? Is that stress management? We, 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 we showed that there are so many factors at play. So now we really have to nuance all that and figure out what, where do we start if we want to develop a program. So, Perfect. So it's leading on to future research as well with, with further yes. work to be done in this space. Yeah, absolutely. And I just wanted to share as well a, new, a recent tool that's been um, published by the Department of Health and Aged Care is called the CHAP or Comprehensive Health Assessment Program Tool. And that's an annual health assessment for people with an intellectual disability. So I think that with what you've talked about today and looking at those risk factors and Clara, you were just mentioning about the HbA1c, that's one of the things that they ask about if they've had that test done or when that was done. So that's another tool that could be used in general practice. So for families and supporters, people with intellectual disability as well to have access to that annual health assessment to try and sort of address some of those risk factors early. Excellent. So I would um, like to ask any attendees to please take the time to complete the evaluation survey from today's webinar, which has been added into the chat. And I would like to give a really sincere thank you to both Elizabeth and Clara for coming and presenting with us today, sharing your research and say really well done for all of the research that you've done. So we're really fortunate to have presenters as skilled as yourselves involved and um, it's very much greatly appreciated. So thank you both. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Thank you.